All right, welcome back. You don't want to miss this session. Some of my favorite sessions at conferences like this are the question answer sessions because a lot of the details come out in the question answer sessions. But for those that don't know, my name is Leighton Flowers. I'm the director of evangelism for Texas Baptist. I get to work with, uh, with Eric uh, and Carlos and many of the others that you may have seen here in breakout sessions and uh, love the, this work and uh, love being a part of Texas Baptist, this church. Um, uh, along with many other churches, about 5,000 or plus uh, around the state of Texas are uh, associated with Texas Baptist Ministries. And so what we get to do with conferences like this uh, here in Orange and around the state of Texas is to come and talk about things that are so important to the church. All right, um, make your way to the microphone if you'd like to ask a question. And it looks like we have someone already. So jump in there. First victim. Uh, I wanted to ask the question, um, and, and I tend to, to uh, emphasize this for uh, Mr. Moreland, I, or Dr. Moreland, I, uh, I feel that the Lord, uh, there's some immediacy to witness because of the times we're in. I, I feel that we're uh, very close to the Lord's return. And I don't get the sense many churches are responsive to the Holy Spirit when I see God closing the age in. Uh, do you sense anything spiritually in the way the Lord's directing you to pray for miracles? And does it also impact for the rest of you the intensity with which you bring your message out that, uh, that you encourage people to witness more uh, with, with more vigor because of the time? I think so, because uh, part of it's that I'm getting older and I wanna make sure that I finish the job that I've got was assigned before I leave. Part of it's the sign of the times and I think it's not business as usual. Uh, but uh, it's not just miracles, but it's also uh, discipleship and apologetics, and I am more fervent than ever for an old man. And with respect to witnessing and, and evangelism, uh, it, it, does this give you guys any more intensity to do what you do with more vigor or differently? Uh, just uh, so I, I'm on college campuses a lot uh, and, and just seeing in my own generation the people I grew up with seeing where they're at now what has really given me that that sense of vigor is really a heart for the lost despite how much time I have left whether Christ is coming tomorrow or in a hundred years there's this sense of urgency and a, a genuine care for people that I see who are dying and going to hell in a handbasket and sometimes for really dumb arguments and uh, uh, in brief uh, there is a, a movement in the Philippines where there's a rise in atheism. I was asked to debate one of the founders of one of their atheist movements. And as I was studying for this debate and I was listening to some of his arguments, my first thought was, these are horrible arguments. If this is all he has, they're in a lot better shape than I thought. But then another thought dawned on me. If this is the best the atheist has and they're growing, then perhaps it's not because they're right, but because they're loud and the church is comparably silent. And that was what really hit me like a ton of bricks, that there needs to be an urgency of equipping the body of Christ to respond. Because if people are going to reject the gospel, we need to make sure they're rejecting a biblically accurate gospel, not some characterization, 21st century American Christianized gospel. Amen. Well said. All right. Lady. Um, I've heard people say that creationism takes away from the reliability of the Bible. Uh, what are y'all's opinions on creationism and or theistic evolution? In terms of evolution, I, I'm not a theistic evolutionist only because I think we have to redefine words in order to get there, right? So under theism, it, it, this is a, a guided process in which God guides the creation of the universe. Under evolution, it's an unguided process in which just elements, aspects of space, time, matter, physics, and chemistry are impacted on by environment, and you end up in an unguided, they would say it's not random, they would say it's at least guided by physics, but it's not guided by intelligence. So under theism, it's, a, a the, it's intelligently guided. Under atheism, it's unguided. So to say that you're a theistic evolutionist means that you, are, you believe that something is intelligent. There's an intelligently guided, unguided process. You see the problem? We have to redefine one term or the other, I think, in order to use them together. And I still, I'm not compelled by the evidence for evolution anyway. That, that, that's another issue for me. Um, here's one thing we all agree on, whether you are a young earth creationist or an ancient earther Christian, if you're a fan of one speaker or one thinker or another, we all agree that God creates in progressive steps. 
because clearly he could have blinked it all into existence full form in one millisecond, but for some reason he creates in steps over a period of six days. The only thing we argue about is how long is each day. But it turns out there's a lot that we agree on. And so I'm more inclined to uh, agree on what we agree on and not divide over what we don't. Okay. Thank you. I think that's a real valuable point because I see so much disagreement among Christians over secondary matters. And I think there's some really strong arguments made by people on both sides, but at the same time, they can still say, you know what, I would much rather you believe in, uh, you know, an old earth and still be a Christian or a young earth and still be a Christian than to give up Christianity because of that particular point or that particular argument. So that's a, that's a great point. And when you ask your questions, if you have a specific a scholar you would like to address that to, let, let us know that, that that way they know uh, who who you'd like to answer first. And of course, in, anybody's welcome to jump in and answer, but if you have a specific person you want to hear from, let us, let us know that. Yeah. Go ahead. All right, so this is specifically for Dr. Moreland in particular. Um, I'm just curious your thoughts. Oh, a little closer. A little closer. Thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, just your thoughts, Dr. Moreland in particular, on just, so I think there's a lot of emphasis on like the value of uh, not not prayer. Like, I guess, what's, what are your thoughts on the role that the Holy Spirit has in guiding us in our individual day-to-day -day lives in terms of interpreting, like, should I make this decision or this decision? Um, do you play, do you, like, sometimes I think maybe that's overemphasized, so I'm just curious your thoughts on whether the Holy Spirit works in that way. I definitely think it's overemphasized because it's due to laziness or a way to protect myself from being responsible for my decisions. Because you can stay in passivity if you say, well, I'm waiting on the Lord to lead me, and so I don't have to step out and be responsible. So here's my view on God's guidance. I think that God has, uh, sometimes has a very specific will for you, and other times he doesn't. And I take that from biblical examples where there were very specific things people were supposed to do. And then there's a text where David uh, uh, seeks God as to what he's supposed to do through the prophet Nathan. And God says to him, do whatever's in your heart and I'll go with you. So that one of the reasons we're here is for God to be able to mature us so that he can trust us to do what we want to do. We're here to count. So God doesn't have something for us to do with everything, but there's sometimes he has a specific thing, so you have to use wisdom. So wait a while, and if you don't get anything, I'm stepping out, Lord, and doing what I think's best. And if I'm wrong, please change my direction. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello, um, this is for uh, uh, Mr. Wallace. Um, so I was, I've been considering a lot of how some of the gospel accounts synthesize. And I've noticed that sometimes when you speak or in the articles that you write, you kind of mention uh, certain examples from your experience as a uh, homicide detective, um, that there can be different perspectives and they might see and perceive things that don't actually occur. Do we see that in the gospel? Is there some way to kind of synthesize it in a way where almost all the details intermesh? Or would you say that there's some inherent um, disagreements within their perspectives that are limited because they're, you know, they were human writers and they only had limited vision? Or can we make some super gospel? Okay, so I, I, know, I never said that I think that there are some places where they might be wrong. <clears throat> the things that they, they, they report things that didn't actually happen. Everyone's reporting what they perceived happened. And this is not unusual with witnesses. So I'm not somebody who jumps to like, we have good friends who we all love who would say, well, you can account for the differences between the gospels because maybe there's a genre that allows for people to say things that aren't totally true because that this was common in the first century. I don't accept that view because I've interviewed too many witnesses. If this thing happened two hours ago, I guarantee you four of you will not agree. And defense attorneys love this because they're gonna leverage your disagreements to argue that none of you are reliable. But it turns out that when we get a jury, I wish I could say all decision making is based on a presentation of facts. But all observations are not based on a presentation of facts. It turns out it's what you like, what you don't like, your preferences, it's your history, it's your, it's your culture. These are things you end up focusing on certain things. For example, if we had a robbery right here and I was looking at what kind of shirt it is, I guarantee you if I ask someone like Eric, he's gonna go, I don't know, t-shirt? But if I ask this woman sitting right here on the end of the second row, she's going to say, yeah, it was a soft collar shirt. It had a soft, not the hard collar, the soft collar. And it was elastic on the armband, you know, and it had the little logo over here. In other words, there are some people who pay attention to some kind of details and others who don't. If you're a gun nut, that's the person I'm going to ask about what kind of gun it is. 
you probably know what kind of gun it is. If you're not somebody who's a gun nut, you might go, I don't know, a bazooka is so big, <laughs> right? So, I mean, this is the kind of thing you're going to hear. So if God's intention was to deliver to us four accounts that were so grounded in reality that they would have all of the attributes of reliable eyewitness accounts, he did a wonderful job. Because you can test them, you can sort through them as eyewitness accounts, and they end up passing the tests. Now, there's a test for these. And I talk about it in a book called Cold Case Christianity. You test eyewitnesses. You don't trust any eyewitnesses. But when an eyewitness reports to me, I don't begin by trusting him. I begin by testing him. If he passes the test, I know he'll make it in trial. And then I bring him into a trial. But you've got to pass the test. And there is a test, and I supply it to the Gospels, and that's how I got here. Hmm. Thank you. Hello. Um, this is an extension of the God's guidance question that was answered or asked a couple times ago. Um, so on the guidance from God, okay, so if you feel like you're being pulled in a certain direction, like you're struggling between things, how do you know if it's, okay, God's pulling me in this direction or is the devil trying to distract me from the other way or am I convincing myself of what I just want to hear? Uh my first advice is, God wants you to turn on the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. My first advice is don't overthink it. Uh, because one of the worst ways to hear God's direction or speaking to you is if you're sitting there waiting for him to speak to you. Because then you're analyzing every thought, well, how was that? And, and you're, you're, you kill it by, by overanalysis. So what I do is I just live my life and I am open myself, Lord, I'm open to you guiding and speaking to me. And I try to be attentive during the day. And um, I, I tend to go with the things that are in my heart or place. Sometimes I get a stream of thoughts in my mind that just are not the way I talk to myself. And or trial and error, I've learned that usually it has a certain texture to it and it's usually the Lord, because when I follow it, something happens that was unlikely, and it kind of verifies it. And, and so what you do is uh, you, you live your life, you, you take risks, not huge ones, but if you make a mistake, learn from it, and after a while, you'll get better at discerning. I think we, 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 there's no doubt in my mind demons and the devil are real, and they do, and they do try to misdirect us, but I, let the, we, we give them too much credit. Hmm. I mean, they're not, I'm not afraid of them because I have authority because of Christ over them. And so I just, I, I say, Lord, if this, is, if this is not you, then I, I ask you to take it away in your name. And I just move on. And so I would not be overly worried unless you have a particular history of your past, of occult activity in your parents or whatever, or that you have a, 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 a overly anxious uh, personality disorder, then you, you might have a little bit of difficulty here in the Lord. But apart from that, you learn by trial and error, and I'd go with it if you're open. I'd go ahead and go with it and see what happens. Having, uh, Unless it's a, go ahead. Oh, I'm you, sorry. You, no, no, please. Uh, I was just going to say, having read Dr. Hazen's book on prayer, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that as well. On not only praying to the Father, but listening and guidance from the Father. I'd love to hear your feedback on that. Yeah, in my, uh, as, as I grow older, I pray a lot more, just about the dumbest things all the time. <laughs> because I just get a kick out of watching God do it. <laughs> so, yeah, the nature of the book on fear, fearless prayer uh, is really keying on the verse in the Gospel of John, John 15, 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Ask for anything and you shall have it. Now, you know what I've discovered is, is uh, uh, pastors and church leaders tend to recoil against that verse these days because they're so afraid of being associated with the word faith movement right. and some weird TV Christianity. Yep. It really scares them to death. But if you leap back in history past the time when the word faith movement got going, like back to the time of Charles Spurgeon, he loved that passage. Yeah. He'd camp on it and preach on it for weeks and say, this is the most exciting part of the Bible. He actually thought if he asked God, God would do it. <laughs> I'm starting to think that's right. <laughs> uh, 
So I want to encourage you all to really, you know, break out a little notebook and keep a prayer journal, not to write all your spiritual thoughts in, but bullet points about prayers that you make during the day, especially if you have a, a certain quiet time and you're praying for people. And just look, reflect back on that about every few months ago. Wow. God really is doing this stuff. Pretty soon you're going to start paying for parking spots. I swear you're going to start praying for parking spots. <laughs> uh, one, briefly, one thing that's really helped me. So I'm, I'm what you call a mullinist uh, without going to the details. I know that God knows me so well. He not only knows what I will do, but what I, uh, what I would do given a different situation. So I take great comfort in the fact that God knows me well enough to know how to get my attention and how to make it clear. Now that's gonna be different for everyone. Uh, there was a time in my life where I was praying about a decision and someone that I didn't really know and didn't really trust, and if I can be honest, didn't really like, gave me a, an alleged prophetic word which was the opposite of what I was feeling God tell me to do. And I just kinda of sat and thought, now if God wants me to, if God wants to clearly communicate something to me, he's gonna do it through someone I trust, someone I know, someone that I can confide in, not someone who I don't know and maybe heard about my situation. So take comfort in the fact that God knows what it takes to move you, and when you, there's a, a sense of peace like JP was talking about, uh, when you're praying about these things, and know that God, you know how much of a knucklehead I am, personally speaking, so I'm going to go this way, and if it's not you, bump me the other way and let me know and make it clear, and he'll do that. Hmm. Well said. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you for each year ministries. Um, I'm in the field of computer science, and I love video games. And it looks like um, maybe there's quite a bit of scientific evidence that we see now, specifically in quantum physics, where it seems to be like we are in a virtual world, quote unquote. And there's just a lot of things that I see in the real world that are very much in parallel with uh, computers and how we do video games, for instance. I've only seen a few YouTube videos on this in apologetics that explore the topic. I was wondering, if in your kind of higher circles, it just hasn't reached us laymen yet. Do you all talk about that possibility that, you know, are we, um, you considering that we, it seems like we are in a kind of virtual or created world, which is kind of obviously the evidence for a creator? Yeah, it, 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 two things. Don't, don't build your ontology or your view of reality based on quantum physics. It's a, that's a fool's game. There are 14 different philosophical interpretations of quantum data. And you seem to be presupposing the Copenhagen interpretation, according to which there, there is no location or a momentum to a particle until it's measured. So there is nothing there, and we collapse the wave function, and then there's something there. I, I, I'm a hidden variable guy. I think there's a real world out there, even at the quantum level, prior to our measuring it and Heisenberg's indeterminacy was epistemic, not ontological. Now, it doesn't matter if anybody understood a word I said. The imp no, no, no. <laughs> the important thing is, the important thing is, you, you don't build your metaphysics on quantum physics. It's a, it's a house of cards. So forget about that. Now, could the world be, could the world be a, a virtual reality? No. Because in order to judge something as a virtual reality, you already have to have a concept of reality. But if the world were virtual reality, you would never have exposure to a real world in order to even form the concept of reality. A blind person has, doesn't have a concept of red because they've never been aware of it. And if there was a virtual reality, a person would not have a concept of reality because they would have never bumped up against it. Consequently, the very concept of a virtual reality presupposes that there is a reality that we're aware of to even form the concept of a virtual reality. And that's why it's self-contradictory that there's a matrix. Makes good Hollywood, but bad philosophy. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to take it from a philosophical perspective, but just think about what's happening here. There are people in the last couple of years have written about this at the, LA, at the New York Times. Philosophers are like, you know, we actually, here's the idea. The idea is that we are in a world that is not real. It's just a computer simulation. And the idea would be that if we were to go right now and reconstruct, uh, say, 1776, and we knew enough about all the players at the signing of the Declaration, could we not program the actors to behave in certain ways based on what we know about their, their behaviors to kind of 
have a simulation of 1776 signing of the de declaration. Well, you could, but we have limited uh, knowledge and limited computer abilities right now. But a thousand years from now, we could do a much better job of that because we'd have better understanding of computer simulations and how to build them. Well, so couldn't somebody be in our future? And they're building a version of 2022 and their computer capacity is so much better, they've built one that actually feels like reality for those of us who are in the simulation. That's his view. Interestingly, he says, if we did discover that we were in a simulation, we should not speak it out loud because they might turn it off. <laughs> now, what he says is also is that any experience of evil in our present world is not intentional from the programmers. It's where the programmers are not, it's error, it's programming error. So now we have a tornado, it wasn't meant to be here, but it's a programming error. So it's, so look at what they're doing. They've reconstructed a world in which there is a creative power, but because of a human error, we're in the world we have now, and we ought not complain about it because they'll judge us, that creative power will judge us and some. They're recreating the Christian story, folks. <laughs> And, and so this is why, we, and we do this, 83% of the world believes in some form of higher power. We are born with the innate understanding that the design features we see in the world are attributable to a designer. And atheism is an acquired position by every study. So the reality of it is, is that even when people make this kind of a claim, they are simply, re by the way, what's great about that kind of a claim is we all want to create our own version of God because it allows us certain liberties. We don't want to have to read an ancient text that says, oh, really, ooh, I shouldn't be doing that. And that's why we are inclined to create such fictions to begin with. Thank you all. Appreciate it. So, yeah. Hello, this is to any of the panel members. I've just been personally struggling with the eternality of punishment in hell, and I was just wondering how you all would um, reconcile that. So, so, yeah. Reconciliation of eternal punishment. Oh, eternal punishment. Okay, that's... Uh... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't believe that physicians ought to murder patients. Uh, I think they can let them die if they're terminal by re taking them off food and water, but they shouldn't inject them and kill them. And that's because I think we have value because we're made in God's image and we just exist. We don't get our value from our quality of life. Uh, so if a patient's in a low quality of life, it's still wrong to kill them because they still have great value because they are God's image bearers. Now, that's why there's a hell. Because if God cannot persuade them to come to him, and if he can't annihilate them, because that would be to do so on the basis of a quality of life judgment. Because God would say, hell is so bad that these people, I'm going to annihilate them. But then that would be to deny they have intrinsic value that make, gives them their worth irrespective of their quality of life. So the only option he has is quarantine. And that's what hell is. It's a quarantine. Now, I don't think there's torture in hell. I think the flames are figures of speech. If you take them literally, you've got a contradiction. Hell's outer darkness, but it's got flames in it. So that it, everybody, it, most theologians that love the Lord and the Bible take that as figurative for judgment. And judgment is essentially being cast away from anything good uh, and, so, and so on. And so uh, if they can commit the ultimate crime of denying their creator, they will pay the ultimate price for that. And it may be that people can get out of hell, but they won't. No one will ever leave hell, even though they, maybe they could. So we've got to distinguish between what a person could do and what they would do. I don't believe anyone who goes to hell ever gets out of it. But what if I were to hold? Well, they could, but they won't want to. They just won't. Well, then, then the door is open and they could get on, so they got nobody to blame but themselves, not only for going there, but staying there. So that's a possible answer, but it doesn't imply that people will choose to leave hell because the longer they're there, the less they'd want, to leave, they'd want heaven. So that's a possible answer, but don't hear me saying that people are going to be able to get out of hell. They, they, they won't. Thank you. So um, back to virtual reality or what we're doing now is uh, reality bubbles where people can make their own individual realities. 
and then we find postmodernism and uh, a number of these uh, movements that are using your own personal identity as a weapon. So how does the Christian world respond to um, individuals' ability to create their own world and then operate uh, kind of autonomously within that world? And what do we do about it being weaponized? Did that make sense? Um, I've been thinking a lot about this because I think you're right. I think that fewer and fewer of us are making decisions about Christianity on the basis of evidence or even experience. I think we're making our decisions about Christianity based on identity. Do we want to be identified this way? Do we want this to be who we are? I notice my, my son is 33. He does podcasts with me every week. And we, we run every week. And while we're running, we're just arguing about theology and current events. And my wife's like, really, the whole run you're going to talk about this stuff? And I'm like, yeah, this is just how guys talk. But we then talk about it on the podcast. And what we've been saying is, and what I've been saying is that I think he will say this, that in his generation, if someone said, and this is just keep in mind, he's just hearing others, non-Christians say this. If I have to vote for Donald Trump in order to be a Christian, I can't be a Christian. Now, regardless of whether you like that view or not, the idea is that he has now connected politics to, his, to a Christian identity. And because he thinks, I, regardless if it's one side of the aisle or the other, it doesn't matter. If you think that your theistic identity is tied in politics, you're out. So here's what I would say, and I've been t trying to include this in my gospel presentations to young people. Look, all of us right now have decided we are our own identities. It's all subjectively driven. I can get this tattoo, this hair color, claim this sexual identity, and I'm my own isolated, unique unicorn. So I'm important because I have this identity I've created. How is that working for you? Are we more unified as, as a world? We're socially tribal on the social media. It's tribal media. We are more entrenched than ever before. We don't trust each other. We don't trust each other's identities. If there were only two possible identities on planet Earth, we'd be divided in half. If there are three, we'd be divided in thirds. If there are three billion, we'll be divided into three billion groups. There's the problem. We're not more unified, we're less. But it turns out there is a worldview that's not grounded in your personal subjective opinion. It's grounded in a set of objective truth claims that are outside of you and very ancient. It has the power to unify us. We have to make a decision if we are going to be unified. And I would not suggest we just pick a worldview because it has the unifying power. I suggest we pick a worldview that is actually true. That's why we make a case for this one objective, ancient, true worldview. Because this is the thing that can unify us. This is the thing that solves every... The gospel cures every kind of stupid you can think of. <laughs> it does. Well, I think I've just started saying, hey, is this outcome working for you guys? Because every young person who's chosen this identity realizes they're not comfortable. It changes every... They're constantly comparing themselves to others. In other words, there's no unity in this. And they're feeling more and more isolated, and they do this by choice. So I just want people to stop for a second and say, is this a better world? For very selfish reasons, is, is it better? I think they know it's not. And I want to start there to have the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I'll be addressing the whole panel, but first I wanted to thank you for your time and, and being here. Um, how do we better equip evangelists in a secular world that denies evidence? Can you repeat it? Can you just say that one more time, closer to the mic? How do we better equip evangelists in a secular world that denies evidence? Do what to, how do we better equip evangelists in a secular world that denies evidence? <laughs> I don't know, just beat them with a microphone. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. I was going for the easy question. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know where you go with that. I mean, they have to live with it every day. They, 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 they face evidence daily. I mean, the, the people who are really good at this would be like uh, uh, Theravada Buddhists, you know, because uh, ultimately they're, they have no self even. I mean, not, if, if you actually follow their philosophy, there's just nothing going on there. The, uh, uh, the Sanskrit term would be anatman. There's no self whatsoever. Uh, these are the people who could face life and not care when you, when you bring up issues about evidence or objectivity and they're their cousins, the Zen Buddhists would do the exact same thing. Is they like, man, you are just so wrapped up in that kind of thing. You need to go get a life. That's what they would tell me as a, as a Christian actually thinks, uh, 
you know, objective evidence can lead to religious truth. But something's got to ground them some, sometime in some way. And uh, that's why I find the Buddhist worldview so fascinating. How do they live day by day thinking ultimately I'm to discover there's nothing that I actually haven't existed, that I've had no center or soul, you know. Uh, so I, I use them as an example to show that there's, there's all kinds of ways people can cope. And, they've been, and Buddhists have been coping with uh, these ideas for 2,500 years. So humans have tremendous uh, ability and resilience to just deny basic objectivity. I think Jesus' job and the apostles' job, that's why I'm so attracted to Christianity, was to, was to shake people. Uh, that's why Paul knew nothing except Christ crucified and risen. Uh, this is the center. This is the thing we've been looking for. Uh, objective evidence that God really does exist. He cares about us and he will save us and raise, up, raise us up on the last day. Uh, this is golden. Can I just add one last quick? I, know, I, I want to get to everyone before we go. We have to kind of jet out at some point with, with you, JP. But, but I'll just say this to you. It's not true that anyone holds a view without evidence. Everyone is innately evidential by nature. You know, when you burn your hand on the stove, you've got good first-hand direct evidence that you should not do that again. So we are all, there's only two forms of evidence. There's, evident, there's uh, direct evidence and indirect evidence. There's no such thing as hard evidence. So there's no hard evidence for Christianity because there's no hard evidence for anything. It's not a category. There's only two categories, direct and indirect. Direct is what you can observe. It's eyewitness accounts. When you burn your hand, that's direct evidence that that is hot. Indirect evidence is everything else. Jesus uses both, but everyone does. Young people do as well. If they don't trust what you're saying evidentially, it's because they think the evidence over here is stronger. They don't come at it without some first case being built in their head that's based on some form of evidence. It's impossible to get anywhere without it. So I think young people actually think that every claim can be answered evidentially. And that's why they think, well, look, I've got a case for why I should wear a mask and take a vaccination. You guys have, I just have blind hope. And so I'm following the evidence trail. That's why right now scientists are more trusted than clergy. It's because we are now in an evidence-based world. We can compete in that world. So what to do is for every young person, we have to give them two whys for every what. The what is, here's what's true about God. Here's what's true about Jesus. Here's what's true about the Bible. That's fine. Everyone's got a what. The question is, can you give them the whys? The first why is, why do you believe that? Why is that true? On the basis of what evidence can you make such a claim? You believe in the triune nature of God? On the basis of what evidence? You believe in the reliability of the scripture? On the basis of what, what evidence? So that's the first why that every young person thinks we ought to be able to offer because it turns out everyone in every other worldview is offering that why. We gotta be able to do it too. The second why though I think is even more difficult and that is okay, great, you, this, you believe this and here's why you believe it. Why do I care? Why should I care about this? Why does it matter to me? You're geeked out as a 60-year-old theologian. I'm not geeked out on that stuff, so I don't care. It doesn't apply to me. So we have to help young people to see, number one, these are the claims of Christianity. Number two, here's why we know they are true evidentially. Number three, here's why this is going to change the way you're going to behave tomorrow on TikTok. This has application. And we have to be able to help young people to see it. And if all they care about is the outcome on TikTok, that would be enough reason to study this. But there's a better reason. Jim and I need to take off, to, but I want you to stay because I want the other panelists to have a chance to finish the questions, but we want to thank you for having us, and uh, let's not, uh, you don't need to clap, let's just keep on going. <laughs> thank so, you. Next person. Thank you. Appreciate y'all. Yeah. He said don't clap, but... <laughs> Go ahead. If it's permissible, I've got a second question about this book. I mentioned to Dr. Hazen earlier today. But um, my first question is, um, I don't have a problem really with uh, dealing with somebody. They say, if there's a God, why is there pain and suffering in the world? But right now I'm, in, I'm reading in Deuteronomy and you know about God commanded the, the death of you know, entire villages, uh, cities of uh, you know, the men, women, children, everybody. And so I'm just wondering how you address that with a non-believer. Yeah. Uh, in some ways, non-believers have us on this one. And I, I say that just from a standpoint of technique, because I actually think that the, there's a legitimate answer to this question. But it actually requires mature Christian life to understand it. I mean, you have to understand that there is a God who's the author of life and death. 
You have to understand there's a God who actually would allow the flood to wipe people out in judgment. And uh, we have to look at God as a judge. We're not good at looking at uh, God as a judge. Christians in our day and non-Christians in our day. But you have to have that understanding to really look at this and make sense of it. Because it was, it was a judgment. And that's why it's men, women, and children in the same way the flood uh, judgment took place. And the final judgment will be for men, women, and children as well. It was a form of judgment. Now, there's a lot more detail we can go into, but I'll see what these guys have to say. Uh, yeah, you should have asked when they were here. And so, but no, um, uh, yeah, there's, so first I'd say there's a great book called Is God a Moral Monster by Paul Copin. Uh, you can check that resource out, great resource. But uh, as Dr. Hazen was saying, there's there's different passages, different contexts, but, but there's a few things we can say, and, and I'm going to uh, tread lightly because I know that once this hits YouTube, there's going to be some atheists watching who will pull some clips out of context. I can, I'll send you the link once they post that. I can guarantee you that. Uh, but a few things. One, um, with, with a certain group, God was, first of all, giving them grace and basically said they haven't reached their peak, so I'm not going to judge them. So on the one hand, let's set the women, uh, children issue aside. On the one hand, I, I can think of it this way. If I have cancer in my pinky... I can, for the sake of the body, cut off the pinky. And, and in a real sense, the, there, was, there was some wickedness, and without going into the graphic detail of some of these people sacrificing their children, burning them alive, incest, rape, molestation, all these things, God giving them grace, time to repent, they didn't, now he's gonna judge them. He's cutting off the pinky to save the body. In other instances, like let's say the men, women, and children, uh, there, there's a couple views on this. One is that it's hyperbolic, metaphoric. Uh, one that it's, it's a certain type of language. And then uh, uh, Dr. Craig says, but let's, let's take worst case scenario. And, and here's where I want to tread lightly. If, if you have these young children that, that were defeated, because, well, before I go there, also the er some of these areas that were conquered were also uh, military bases, if you will. There would have not been women and children fighting there, first of all. So it could have been hyperbolic. On the other hand, I've talked to people who've gone over to the east and are traumatized because they've had to with their own hand, take down a child 10 to 12 years old because when they took down the child with the sniper rifle, they open up, the, open up their shirt and their strap, they have bombs strapped to their vest. In other words, anyone in that area should be considered a threat because they are uh, uh, willingly, willingly and nobly in an area where there's combat, so they're there for a reason. On the other hand, with the younger, let, let's say this was a command, there were children. He, and this is a hard pill to swallow by all means, but if we have a God first and foremost, that is all loving and omniscient. I, I had one, one theologian said, if God would let me bow, borrow his omnipotence for one day, I would change so much. But if he gave me his wisdom and omniscience, I wouldn't change a thing. And if God knows all things, then you can in a real sense say it is a sign of God's grace and mercy to take children at, a, at an age where they almost get a free pass, if you would, to heaven. Suppose he lets these children live. They grow up, live in a pagan nation, and then try to fight back the people of God in a revenge, so to speak, die and go to hell. On the other hand, if he takes them at a young age, knowing the situation, though it's not ideal, they're in heaven in his presence. Now, granted, that's a whole worldview to explain, but if there is a God, and if he is all-knowing, omniscient, omnibenevolent, at the end of the day, I'm going to trust his judgment. Even if I may not, even if I, it makes me feel a certain way about it. But it, again, it goes back to the question, well, is there such a God? And I definitely believe there is. And I know there is. And I have reasons for it. Shall I ask my second question? Sure. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I've got, a, I've got a 1954, at least it was printed then, a Moffat Bible. Okay. And like the 14th chapter of John comes after the 17th chapter of John. It's got some oddities in it like that. But, but overall, it looks like it's pretty reliable. Um, and then I have a friend who says, hey, if you get a new international version of the Bible, it should be like 1984 or before that because it's more reliable or something. I'm just wondering if there are some uh, Bibles out there or this one that you say, oh, well, I would depend on that. Or Yeah, I, I use the NIV both pre-1984 and post-1984. You know, I know after 1984 they used some languages. Some people were upset about. And uh, you can go back to the pre-1984 and it's just as good. I, I I've always loved the NIV and the NASB and, and other letter formations. Uh, but you have a very interesting Bible, or the Moffat Bible. I don't remember. I remember there were some issues, but I mean, it kind of predates me. 
Uh, but just the fact that you have one is a cool thing because that does show up in like the list of Bible translations that scholars might crack open to see how uh, uh, those, this translator rendered the passage. So in other words, it's kind of a player in helping to interpret. Maybe these guys remember something about the Moffat translation. No, I, I know that every, every translation is an interpretation. And so sometimes you have people who go extreme, only the King James Version is good enough for Paul, good enough for me kind of statements. And, uh, and just trying to you know, help people to understand that people are putting together the best translations that they can based upon the information that we have. And, and most translators of the, at least the, the mainstream versions that we have, have done a really good job of doing that for us. And I think all of them are great tools for helping us to understand the original translations. And so they can be good tools for us. Uh, that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. I really enjoyed this conference so much. I'm curious you how... Know what, I, yeah, just to interrupt here, I'm, I actually have severe hearing loss. And yes, so, um, and uh, the men's voice, they do pretty, I do pretty well with that. Oh, but these, these lovely women's voices, like, are completely, whoosh, you know, right by me. But stepping up to the mic, it yeah, helps a lot. Really lean into that microphone. Thank you. I'm curious your advice to wanting to live with people and witness to them and want them to come to the Lord, but also building a relationship first and not coming in with a hidden agenda to where they would then be put off by that. Yeah, uh, so I have a... A lot of, I live in Southern California, there's a lot of Mormons, really. I mean, the, from Southern California all the way up through Idaho, you know, is like a Mormon corridor. And uh, I approach people differently depending on the circumstance. For instance, if I have a Mormon neighbor, I will spend a lot of time building a relationship and bringing up theological issues slowly so that we can, we can interact with them and and, uh, and it tends to be very effective over the long haul, and that's my preferred method. But occasionally, you'd get an opportunity uh, where that, that presents itself, boom, it's a one-shot deal. So, for instance, the Mormon missionaries come to my door. Usually, it's only a one-time experience for them. And uh, when they come and they knock and I open the door, and there they are, uh, uh, I do my best to leave the biggest, sharpest pebble I can in their shoe so that when they walk away, every other step is ouch, ouch, ouch. So, so gives, give them something very deep to think about. Uh, and I've been pretty successful at that time. In fact, one guy, he didn't even make it out of my house before he started having some pains. He was actually curled up on the couch in the fetal position. Could you imagine? I, I mean, one of my areas of expertise is Mormonism. I mean, I, I have two Mormon apostles on speed dial. I mean, I'm pretty well connected with this whole thing. So a couple of missionaries show up at my door one time and uh, for one guy, it was his very first missionary visit to any house ever. <laughs> he, he's now a Christian. <laughs> he is. It, it, it took years uh, of interacting with him once he got off his mission. And uh, ha, now, now he's writing the books to his former brethren, and it's, it's wonderful. But, but just to show you, there's two, two wonderful approaches. So if you have Mormon or, or unbelieving uh, neighbors, family members, coworkers, you know, I, I would approach them differently too, building the relationship and bringing up the issues one piece at a time so you can build a record of wisdom in their eyes, if at all possible. Well, I think what you give people that impression is if you do witness to them and they don't accept Christ, that you drop them and you move on, that, that's what's gonna give that kind of impression. Uh, I think of Eric and his work with apologetics and he, he, he talks to atheists all the time, but he's one of the best about keeping relationships open with those atheists that he talks to. And so he doesn't start treating them differently if they, he can't convert them. In other words, he continues to respect them, continues to talk to him, keeps the dialogue open. And that shows that you're still going to love the person even if they don't accept your beliefs. Uh, and that speaks volumes to when you're doing true evangelism because it's a long-term process. And oftentimes it's not necessarily the atheists that you debate that you're gonna convert, but the people who are watching how you treat them and how you continue to show them love years and years after uh, even the first conversation. So it's a long-term effect. Yeah, and I'd say it's gonna depend who you talk to as well. Uh, like uh, Craig was mentioning, you know, with Mormons, you know, there's, there's a certain level of gentleness you want, 
But I think of someone like my brother Ronnie, uh, who did a breakout on reaching Muslims. One of the things I love that he says is Muslims, they can smell if you're being fake from a mile away and they don't want to have anything to do with it. If, you, if you're not going to bluntly tell them what you believe and what your agenda is, they say, don't even talk to me because you don't take your faith as seriously as you think you should, so don't even bother. So it's going to depend who you talk to, as, as uh, Leighton was saying with uh, some non-believers. You know, I've, I've heard the saying, some people don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. I have found sometimes the opposite applies. I, I, there are some atheists who don't care how much I care about them. They care about what I know. And once they know that I actually have read a book or two, they now respect me enough to listen to what I have to say. Whereas someone who's just going to come side and say, I just love you so much. Great, don't want to talk to you. I, I, I want to, you know, maybe, you know, roll up my sleeves, metaphorically speaking, and, and have an intellectual wrestling match, so to speak. Um, and, and they tend to respect. So it's going to depend who you talk to. But at the end of the day, we're going to... I, I have dealt with some of the most obnoxious atheists. You can go on my YouTube channel, shameless plug, uh, if you don't believe me, and just don't read the comment section in front of kids. Um, and at the end of this, still say, hey, can I pray with you? And I had one gentleman who was, I won't mention his name, but let me pray. I mean, here's how he responded. I said, can I pray with you? And he said, you can write a letter to Santa Claus for all I care. And I said, well, I don't want to write a letter to Santa Claus. Can I pray with you here on air? And he said, sure. And he let me pray with him. And afterwards he says, you know, I've always felt like I've had a blessed life. I mean, total change of demeanor within two minutes of prayer. So I, I, I let them know, yeah, I want, I want to see you in heaven. That's my agenda. I, have, I make no apology. And let's, let's hash it out intellectually. And I'm still going to love you, even though you treated me like a jerk. And I want to pray for you because I love you. Your uh, atheist YouTube constituency is all right now doing some navel gazing. Wonder if they're the ones that are obnoxious. You know, <laughs> they're, they're all wrestling with that. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so this question was actually from Mr. Moreland, but I'd like to hear y'all's take on this as well. Um, a little bit of context to my question. It seems like there is a rapid increase in the number of believers that are leaving a more traditional biblical Christianity and switching to a new age Christianity that almost in a sense mimics, or not mimics, but is parallel to some Buddhist ideas. Um, and a probably more controversial example of this to an overly spiritualized religion would be the Bethel Church, and I'm sorry for anyone if I just offended you, but um, what is y'all's take on how we should set boundaries in our own personal walks whenever we're considering spirituality? And some of the things that Mr. Moreland said about, um, in a sense, I'm gonna use the term spiritual authority, but whenever we feel spiritual authority on a matter, what is the level to which we should set boundaries for ourselves so we're not crossing that border of um, biblical spirituality to overly spiritualized um, interpretations or manifestations? Yeah, well, one, one thing I'd say is first, anything that, that's gonna be revelation or word of knowledge is, is not gonna contradict scripture. Right? We, we don't believe in this progressive revelation that God's going to change his mind as some other uh, religions do. Uh, on top of that, um, I, I would always say, it, depending on the context, so it was a pretty broad question, which, which is fair, but when it comes to spirituality, when you look in the book of Acts, there was not just miracles happening, there was structure, there was order. In fact, Paul said that these things need to be done in order. There has to be a structure to these things. So de depending on the context, specific, case by case is what essentially I'm trying to say. And, and more specifically, is, is, is God trying to do something in this or am I trying to glorify myself? I've talked to people who claim to have a spiritual authority, but at the same time, they are in no way connected to me, nor am I under them in any type of a, like a mentorship relationship. So you also have to be wary of, of who, who you're letting speak into your life. Does this line up with scripture? Do you feel God moving a certain way? And, and I, w I want to say this too. When I say feelings, I don't mean something like an emotional or burning in the bosom. I mean a legitimate conviction about something. I've told people, you want to follow God's peace because there have been decisions I've made that didn't feel like the right, or I felt like maybe I shouldn't do this, but I had a peace about it, which was conflicting. And there were times where I thought this is absolutely the best decision, but I had no peace about it. And I'm always, and going back to what I said earlier, God knows me well enough to know how to nudge me. And, and I trust him that a lot because I, he, he knows me very well and he's crazy about me. He's crazy about you. And you can ask God, can you make this clearer for me? And at the end of the day, I'm going to say, Lord, I don't know, but this is what I feel you doing. I'm going to go for it. If it's not you, let me know. And close the right doors, open the wrong ones. That's a prayer my wife and I pray just about every night. Yeah. You, you were pointing there to the interactivity of God. He's a person. Yes. He's a real person who cares about you and communicates. And so, you know, and I got to tell you, sometimes he gets silent, though. 
He just goes, he goes dark. Oh, God, where are you? I need help on this. You know, <laughs> pay attention to me. Oh, and he pats me on the head, says, yes, you have a little growing to do here, son. Uh, good luck with that. And, but, but other times he's like all over. He really is this loving dad who loves to see us delighted in his cause for his kingdom. He loves that stuff. So always clarification with God through interaction. He may not answer as fast as we want, but he's very good at answering. Uh, uh, in the book Fearless Prayer, I, I record a, uh, a situation with uh, the, famous, uh, the famous British prayer warrior. Oh, now I'm missing. Uh, George Mueller. George Mueller uh, kept a, a log of prayer requests. George, George Mueller is a guy who's just a, an amazing uh, prayer hero. And, you know, he, he built orphanages, you know, across England without asking anybody for money. I mean, it's just legendary. Uh, but he kept this prayer journal. He had like 50,000 prayers in it. And uh, according to his notations, you know, probably like uh, uh, 40,000 were answered within 24 hours of him asking. That's the kind of God we have. He just delights in interacting with us. And uh, you can never go wrong with clarification with God or uh, interacting with him like he's a real person who you can, you can really talk to. Thank you. So um, just some context here. I was born into a family that is four generations Jehovah's Witness on one side and three generations Jehovah's Witness on the other. And um, I only got saved about six years ago. And um, my family shuns me because of becoming a Christian. And I'm about to have the opportunity to see them again because my grandmother's sick and I need to go take care of her and no one else is able. I know that I'm probably going to be asked to give a defense of my faith. And I've been studying a lot of different defenses. But I figured what better time than to ask somebody. <laughs> Can y'all give me some guidance on what you think would be most effective in talking to Jehovah's Witnesses? Boy, uh, in terms of your situation, I'm so sorry to hear that. That's, 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 that's rough sledding, it really is. Uh, but uh, I don't know that there's anything, you know, magical or, uh, or powerful that you could say that's going to do any job. Uh, I think this is one of those situations where you move in and, and just uh, be in, in, a, in a very Christian way. But there's certain aspects of your life that if you dial those up, they will have more of an impact than even your words. And one would be your peace with God, the peace that you have in your interaction with God. You can almost guarantee that they do not have that. And uh, they, they can't ultimately know if they're even saved, really, because of the good works nature that, that propels them forward. And if you talk about the love and peace and grace of God in your life, and let that live out to be seen by them, it'll be eminently attractive. Uh, I think that's true for, for uh, Muslims, friends and relatives that I have, you know. Uh, <laughs> I have a brother-in-law who, he, he loved to argue that Islam was right, and I, I'd argue that Christianity was right, and then, then he'd, he'd eat a big plate of bacon and drink a big glass of wine, which is kind of not really the Muslim way, and I'd say, dude, you are in such trouble with Allah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, you're not fooling me, you know. And, but it actually goes, I mean, you can actually see, he goes, well, you know, in so many words, he says, how, how could I be saved then? Ah, you know, uh, the same is true. He who lives by works dies by works. Um, I'm, not, I'm not proud of this, but there were some Jehovah's Witnesses who came to my cul-de-sac in Southern California. One time they pull up in a van and they leap out and they, they're all dressed in, you know, nice dresses and slacks and so on. And they, and they disperse through the neighborhood. But I was watching these two ladies who were in my cul-de-sac walk and they're walking so slowly. And by the time they got, I mean, it was like 45, they, nobody talked to them at any door. So they, they, it took them like 45 minutes to get all the way around to my house. And it took them forever. And, and, and I said, ladies, look, I, I'm not sure you're you're really going to get to uh, the final afterlife that you're hoping for. And they said, why? I go, well, you don't seem very enthusiastic about the whole thing. <laughs> and it seems to me that Jehovah would be very concerned you'd be enthusiastic. You know? Well, they were a lot offended by that, and I probably should have used a different technique, but it did make one point, that they are going to live or die by their works. And uh, that's not what you want. You want the peace and grace of God to uh, actually give you 
uh, the, the calm spirit that you're looking for and at the same time be recognizable by others as attractive. I mean, I'm a Christian today because as a senior in high school, I had a chemistry teacher at a secular high school who just lived a Christian life in front of me every day. She had this piece that actually bugged me, you know? Like, what does she have? She had these, this is back in, 19, in the 19, late 1970s, so you could actually have a cryptic God poster on the wall. Didn't actually mention any religion, but you could tell it was like religious, you know? Clearly, that's where she was getting her piece from. But that piece just uh, uh, was very attractive and also very uh, uh, buggy for me. So be at peace and knock them dead, you know? As far as content arguments against specific claims of Jehovah's Witnesses, I would highly recommend Mike Winger's uh, video on that topic. He goes through some specific content issues, um, but nothing like, like Dr. Hazen is saying is going to overpower that peace, that, that, that calmness, that joy that you would exude just in your life. But if God gives you the opportunity to talk through some of the content, um, preparing yourself through watching videos of experts and those who've actually studied the details would not hurt to have those, some of those things ready um, because God can use those as opportunities to, to kind of crack the outer shell, so to speak, and help them to put that, that, that pebble in their shoe to think, what, what, what maybe um, can I reconsider here that, that's not holding water? Um, show them that Jay, Jay Warner Wallace of presentation that you heard earlier today about how much Christianity has impacted our world uh, in every area, that, that in itself is a uh, huge, uh, I would think a huge argument to say that there, you have to do something with Jesus and uh, in Christianity, uh, which is much different than the claims of Jehovah's Witnesses for sure. But thank you for your question. Okay, so I'll apologize in advance that this question might be a little too black and white. But, um, so we have the idea and I, you know, that our, plan, our life is planned out from the time we're born and God already knows what's gonna happen till the day we die and beyond. But we're given decisions every day to make. Why would he give us decisions if he already knows what, like what decisions we're gonna make? Like why is it a choice to be saved if he already knows who's gonna be saved and who's not? If there were only somebody qualified to answer that question. <laughs> uh, he's referring to the, the, I have a sociology podcast, and so we talk about these kinds of doctrines quite regularly. But believe it or not, I think having a resident Molinist on the stage like, go to this question because it has to do with what's called middle knowledge with regard to what we would do, um, which is why it's called middle. And so I, I'm going to let Eric uh, kind of champion that concept because this gets into the philosophical side of sociology. If God knows everything before we ever do it, then isn't that the same as him determining what we're going to do anyway? Um, and, and the typical Molinist, as well as the libertarian free will theologian like myself, would say, no, we still have genuine choice. Knowledge is not causal. In other words, just because because God knows what I'll eat for lunch tomorrow doesn't mean he's going to cause me to eat that for lunch tomorrow. I don't know how he knows what I'm going to eat for lunch tomorrow because I don't even know what I'm going to eat for lunch for tomorrow. I don't. I have no idea. I could even guess. He knows perfectly. But confusing certainty with necessity is oftentimes a philosophical uh, uh, mistake that people make. Because God knows something for certain, therefore he necessitates. He determines that thing. And that's, that's, a, that's a philosophical modal error. And so the explanation needs to be just because God knows something we will do doesn't remove our responsibility in the things that we do that are real in time temporal. But I think Molinism gives a really good explanation as to how that can work with middle knowledge. So if you want to explain that just briefly, I know that's hard to do <laughs> in a few minutes, but if you can explain that briefly. Uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, so there's a, there's a few things within the question, but essentially, so one, one thing to tackle first is do we have still... Do we still have free will if God knows what we will do? Um, the answer is simply yes, because, t I mean, there's really no contradiction. If I know, let's say I know 100% certainty that if I told my daughter, you can clean your room today, or I can take it to the mall and we'll have a shopping spree on me, I know what she's going to do. Does that mean that my knowledge of what she will do cause her to do what she does? Well, no. It's just that I know her so well as her father that I can bet my life on it, this is what she's going to do. Now, I'm a human being, an earthly father with limited knowledge. Now, imagine a heavenly father with infinite knowledge who not only knows what you will do, but knows what you would have done had you had more, one more brother or sister or pet or different kind of parents and knows what you would do in that situation and yet created a world in which you did what you're going to do knowing you could have done something else. 
So that being said, it's not just that God knows what will happen, but knows what would have happened. And also, he just knows you so well, far better than I or anyone else could, that it's not that he's predicting. He knows, one, he's omniscient and necessarily. It's an essential attribute of God. Um, and then the other one was, well, why allow us to make these choices or, or why give us that choice? Well, again, his knowledge of what we'll do is not, knowledge is not causal. I know the sun will rise tomorrow. Do I cause it? No. In fact, if you, without going to the definition of knowledge, I'll just say this, it's a justified true belief. So if you have knowledge of something, it's going to happen. Well, because if you believe something and it doesn't happen, well, then it's not knowledge because it wasn't true. So if you, if you believe something's going to happen and you have a reason to believe it, then you have knowledge. And by definition, it's going to happen. But even your knowledge doesn't cause it. Just because God has this knowledge, it doesn't make it any more spiritually supernatural powerful. It's still knowledge and knowledge is not going to be causal. I would just add one thing. Just keep in mind that when you're talking about a, an infinite God, um, you're talking about things that are infinite and impossible for finite creatures to fully comprehend. That, that's just a given. No matter where you side on the theological debates, that's just a given. There are certain things we're not going to perfectly grasp. But what we can't do is dismiss clear revelation of Scripture with regard to human responsibility. Um, and again, this is something both sides of the theological aisle would say. You're responsible for your choices, and your choices are real. And, and therefore, you're going to be held accountable for the things you do. And when people punt to deterministic logic uh, and the, this kind of um, everything is faded kind of mentality, and it ultimately, uh, they abandon human responsibility or personal responsibility because, hey, it's all determined anyway, or it's all faded. And I, and I think everything within Scripture flies in the face of that kind of thinking. And therefore, we need to look at the decisions we make as real and personal and, and can have an impact. Prayer impacts things. It changes things. And so whenever you have a fatalistic way of looking, you think, oh, why pray? It's all set. You know, wh well, why witness? Because it's all determined. The Bible doesn't talk like that. And so if our philosophical way of thinking is leading us to conclude those things, then we need to rethink our philosophy. We need to rethink the, the way we're looking at the way God created the world um, and, and, and understand that, that God has a way to condescend to our level so that we can understand and relate to him as a real person. Instead of just the omni-everything God, he is a real, like, like Dr. Hazen was saying, he's a person that we can relate to that listens to us, that engages with us in real relationship. That's seen throughout the Old and New Testament. God relates to humans. How does an infinite God do that? That's not fully comprehensible to me, at least. But it is very clearly revealed through Scripture. Is that, that how he chooses to condescend? That's what incarnation is all about, condescending to us. I, I remember an old story of... Um, uh, Nolan Ryan, some of you may remember Nolan Ryan, the great pitcher from the Rangers, uh, when he was, uh, he was on the news and it was showing him in his backyard, he was playing catch with his five-year-old son at the time. And uh, he was pitching to him while he was batting. And he, you sh see him in the back, you know, in the back uh, behind the, the reporter reporting that he's throwing little soft hand pat pitches to his son like this. Now, this is the greatest pitcher possibly in, in uh, Major League Baseball at the time, and he's throwing underhanded. Why? Because he's playing with his five-year-old son. Now, he has the ability to throw the fastball, but he's not going to do that with his son, obviously. He's going to condescend. He's going to come to the level of his son. And in the same way, God has the ability to come to our level and to relate to us in a way that we can relate to him. And to understand that's really important to understand that that's why incarnation is so valuable that he comes as a main as a baby in a manger he comes at our level and relates to us at our level and that's what's so beautiful about our god the fact that he's in infinite but chooses to relate to us on a personal level all right we have enough for probably these last two uh questions um before we we need to dismiss my question is uh in referencing the nephilim in the book of ezekiel no i'm joking uh <laughs> <Nephilim>. <laughs> No, I was going to say, uh, the Nephilim conversation could be a long one, but go ahead. Uh, so it seems like nowadays, I think everybody would agree that people's attention spans have gotten extremely short. And so in my experience, anytime I've ever attempted to speak to someone or to witness to them or to debate them in any fashion, uh, they bring up an objection. 
I just kind of get started in explaining to them, you know, why that, their objection is baseless, and then they jump to the next objection. And what happens is this goes on two or three times, and finally what I tend to do then is say, okay, let's just stop here. This is the Bible. This is what I believe, and I try to start from the beginning because it seems like we're going from here to here to here to here to here. And I wanted to know what is the secret weapon that y'all have that will fix this. Um, shameless plug. Uh, later this year, I'll be coming out with a book on witnessing to non-believers. But what I often find is sometimes when someone says what sounds like an objection, the Christian immediately wants to get defensive and give them answers and responses. I, I take what I've called the lazy approach. Uh, and here's what I mean, I'll give you one example. Uh, one young lady, she said, I'm an atheist because I can only believe things that have evidence and logic behind them. Now, classically, the definition of an atheist is someone who believes God does not exist. So I said, interesting, so what evidence and logic do you have to believe that there is no God? And she said, well, the Bible's full of contradictions. Now, I've often seen Christians jump and start defending biblical inerrancy. My response was, and how does that prove there's no God? And she looked at me like a deer in the headlights because no one's ever asked her that. They begin to respond immediately. So I threw the ball back in her court, lazy approach. And she says, what do you mean? I said, well, let, it, humor me here. If God existed, would he have existed prior to the Bible being written? And she said, well, I don't believe in God. I said, I understand, but if he did, would he exist prior to the Bible being written? She says, well, yeah, if he existed. I said, okay. So if God would exist prior to the Bible being written, how does a Bible full of alleged contradictions make him disappear out of existence? What am I missing here? And I stayed quiet. And I waited. And then she jumped to another one, and then I just kind of did the same thing until I said, I, in the five minutes we've been talking, I'm still, I still haven't heard a reason why you don't believe there's a God. I'm starting to think and wonder if you have any evidence or logic as you said, as to why you believe there's no God in the first place. I put a pebble in her shoe, and if the conversation had stopped there, which it did at a minute later, all I did was ask two or three questions, and the seed was planted. So it's not about how necessarily what to say, but how to respond, and that's a whole other All right. N N last question, real quickly here as we close. Yeah, so I just saw the line was getting short, so I was like, hey, I have one more, like, kind of off-topic question, but I'm just curious. Like, if you guys have any thoughts on, like, theosis in general, or, like, like Theosis, like it's, do you, do you know that term? Yes? Okay, we have at least, okay. Maybe just, we'll, we'll have one person talk about it then, that's good. Just general thoughts on theosis. Yeah. <laughs> or, or like, yeah, like yeah. is, it, is uh, it something that's reasonable based off of the biblical yeah, record? Yeah. Like, yeah. Theosis is the general idea of humans becoming God or God-like. In, in some <laughs> respects, that's what we're talking about as, as Bible-believing, Jesus-loving Protestant Christians when we think about becoming like Jesus. I mean, we talk, we use that language all the time, but we also firmly believe that he's God. So in some sense, we're becoming more God-like as we become like him. Uh, it, I can't give a, a the, the, the wing of Christianity where this is most prominent would be Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, and I wouldn't be able to do justice to their very nuanced concept of theosis. Uh, but I have noticed that Mormons have, have grabbed onto the idea of theosis, which I found very bizarre, because Joseph Smith promised that, uh, you know, Mormon men in good standing and so on will eventually become gods themselves and need to learn to become gods themselves. And they're trying to hold on to theosis as, a, as a, uh, something out of the Christian past that justifies uh, this very strange teaching of Joseph Smith. Uh, apart from that, I couldn't give you the, the, the real nuances need to take yeah. place from the Eastern Orthodox traditions. Perfect. Thank All you. right, let's give our uh, scholars uh, in residence here a hand. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate them being here so much.